Wow, well if you got this far, I applaud you. You've just gone through 27 minutes of the Nissan Qashqai video, uh, maybe 10 minutes of the optional extra, and this is another 33 minutes, so there's like an hour and 10 minutes of videos here. But it, this is the whole of the interview I had with David Tuhig, and again, it's a fascinating insight into a product planner of a whole car program and the issues that they have to go through. So there's a lot more detail in, in, in this video. And um, again, I have to mention David's book, Inside the Machine. Um, I've read certainly the Qashqai part of it and it's, it's a fascinating, uh, in, it's a fascinating insight, I think that's what I said in the uh, in the original video, but I've just been editing the video, so I've just seen that a lot. But it's it's a very interesting book, and I would highly recommend, uh, at least you take a look to see if it's something that you might want to take a look at. So anyway, on with the whole interview. Well, thank you, David, for, for, for agreeing to do this interview. This is fantastic to be able to talk to someone who was so integral to the the Nissan Qashqai project. So first of all, before the Qashqai, there was something called Project B32A. So can you talk to me a little bit about, about that project and how you tried to get it to market? I can. And Andy, thanks very much for inviting me, first of all, and, and secondly, for, for telling the story of this car, because I think it's uh, maybe not as well known as it should be. Not the car itself, but the the story behind it. Um, so yeah, the story does start with one of these rather boring, uh, you know, four letter or four number letter acronyms that car companies love so much. It was a project called B32A. And I talk in the past tense because it never saw the light of day. It's one of those many, many projects that car makers study. And for one reason or another decide that, okay, this is not the one to go forward with. Um, so B32A to tell the story very briefly, this was the project that I was assigned to lead as chief vehicle engineer or chief geek, whatever you, whatever title you want to apply to it. And I was dispatched from Nissan's R&D center in the UK to Japan with about 25 other folks who are willing to up sticks and go to Japan at a moment's notice to continue the development of this project that had been kicked off by our colleagues in Japan. And to very briefly decide, describe the project, it was a sort of a hatchback on stilts. The idea was to do one vehicle that would cover at the same time the kind of traditional hatchback market, but also the small minivan or MPV um, market, which was really hot at the time. Vehicles like the Renault Megane Scenic and Nissan had something called an Almira Tino that some of our, our viewers might remember. And the idea was to sort of do a blend between the two, do a hatchback that was a little bit raised with a higher hip point, better visibility, et cetera. But pretty quickly, we realized that it was going to be a, a very, very difficult project to get across the line. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And so B32A, unfortunately, didn't go ahead. I know you tried your, your damnedest to, to, to get that thing through over the line. But um, eventually, you moved to look at a compact crossover mm. idea. So why, why the compact crossover? Mm. Yeah, so as you say, you know, we, we spent nine months and uh, yeah, we, we really did push it as hard as we could to try and get the numbers to line up on B32A. And the numbers, by the way, they mean business numbers. They mean the, the kind of cold, hard reality of designing a car that not only works, passes all the regulation, et cetera, et cetera, but it was going to actually make money for our parent company. That's after all what we were there for. Um, so once we realized that that wasn't the right project, we couldn't make it the economic case work. We started to look at effectively something that was known as just two, two words, affordable crossover. And the idea really came from previous vehicles. I'd love to take credit, Andy, and say, hey, yes, we, we, we cooked up this idea of the crossover that nobody else had ever thought of. And occasionally the, the vehicle that came to be, Qashqai, is given credit for being the inventor of the cross, crossover segment, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, it's not true. Uh, so I'd cite two vehicles that were pretty much um, inspiration. The first is the Nissan Murano. So we know the Murano here in Europe pretty well, but it's extremely well known in the States. It was already a big hit. We're talking here in 2002. Murano had been launched a year or two earlier, and it was a big, big hit in the States. It really 
you know, good power plant, nice V6 engine, pretty good looks, and it was a, it was a smash hit. So the idea was pretty simple. Um, the chief product planner for Nissan, the head honcho of the product planning at the time was uh, a gentleman called Patrick Palata. And Patrick said to me, uh, David, you know, you know, Nissan Murano? And I said, yes, boss. And he said, well, your team are going to do an 80% photocopy of the Murano. Let's go for it. It really was as simple as that. I know that sounds an oversimplification, but it, it, it was pretty much that. The second vehicle, Andy, that I just, you know, not the tip the hat to in passing, because I think it's a vehicle that doesn't get enough credit, is the little Honda HRV, um, you know, the, the joy machine, as it's sometimes known as. And it was a very, very interesting vehicle because at the end of the 90s, early 2000s, it had already, to some extent, anticipated the crossover market. So we also had that kind of at the back of our mind to see if we could do something like the HRV, but maybe correct some of the, I don't want to say faults that vehicle had, but some of the things that held it back in the market. So why did you think this new compact crossover would be a hit? What, 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 what did it have going for it? You know, I think it's a period, it, one of these perfect storms in the automotive industry where a few trends were coming together. So folks, folks were moving away from the traditional sort of three box saloon car or sedan car that had been the mainstay right through the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s. So that segment, sometimes called the D segment sedan or saloon, that really was dying off. Um, and that was perceptible. Um, there were these MPVs around or people carriers, monospas, whatever label you want to put on them. But they always had a slight taint of not being very fun or not being very trendy. So very practical for taking the kids to school or, you know, dropping the, you know, doing family business. But they never really set anybody's hearts on fire. Whereas the traditional hatchback vehicles like the Ford Focus, Renault Megane, Toyota Corolla, etc. They were clearly a super practical uh, vehicle with good performance, good fuel economy, etc. So the crossover was really trying to do all of that in one vehicle having the, the nice things about the high driving position of a four by four ground clearance, um, but the economy of a hatchback and the, and the, you know, sort of family friendly attributes of MPVs or minivans. So it really wasn't an, an attempt to try and get the best of several types of vehicles and hopefully avoid the, uh, the worst traits of those vehicles. All right. Absolutely. So obviously you're charged with trying to do this compact crossover. And I, I know it was from the book, you, you describe it as a bit of a Hail Mary. It's like this last chance mm. saloon. Uh, mm. Can you describe a little bit about trying to get the project off the ground? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to really over egg the pudding of the Hail Mary, but it, it really was that case, you know, just um, as a quick reminder, only three years before that. So the, the, the period we're talking about is 2002, 2003. A few years before that, in 98, 99, Nissan had almost died. Our company had, you know, came, came so close to bankruptcy that you couldn't get any closer and had been rescued. Of course, the, the story is well known by by Renault, which was also widely regarded at the time as doing something completely crazy. So we really were, the, the, the near death experience of the company was very, very recent memory for us. And more specifically for us in Nissan Europe, it was ongoing because Nissan in Japan was starting to recover, was starting to generate money. Nissan North America was always a sort of a, you know, a, 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 a cash cow for the company. Um, and Nissan North America was really starting to fire on all cylinders, if you'll, if you'll forgive the, uh, the pun. But Nissan Europe, it wasn't the case. We'd had a few vehicles that were, I want to be very respectful to them here, but vehicles like the Almira, Almira Tino, and they hadn't set the world on fire. The last generation of Primera, the P12 Primera, and folks might remember it with the central instrument panel, that also hadn't been a commercial success. So we really were on our last warning. You know, uh, we had to have a successful vehicle and a successful vehicle meant a vehicle that would make money. And that was really, I can't exaggerate too much, Andy, how much that was on my mind, that we had a last shot at designing a successful vehicle for Europe. Uh, it was a team of Europeans that were out there in Japan doing this work. And yeah, I was only 32 at the time. And I can tell you that weighed pretty heavily on my shoulders. Some of these gray hairs that you see would go right back to those days. <laughs> <laughs> you should see the problems I've had. 
Um, so why wasn't this project run by Nissan in Japan then? Mm, that's, a, that's a great question, really. And, and to give you a full answer, we really have to go back to, to the 1980s. Um, because Nissan, you know, Nissan's a very traditional Japanese company with very long roots going back to the 1920s. But to some extent in this, I would say even the 70s and the 80s, it was remarkably outward looking. So rather than just being a company focused on Japan, the Japanese domestic market, it looked overseas and it decided, look, if we want to be a global company, we have to have manufacturing plants overseas. And very unusually, we have to have R&D centers overseas. And that was, I think it was quite prescient, uh, quite an advanced thing, quite a risky thing for a very traditional Japanese company to do. So it had established, Nissan had established R&D centers in Detroit in the mid 80s. And at the very end of the 80s, it had opened a, a Nissan European Technical Center. So the idea really was, and it's a bit of an advertising tagline from the time, but I still like it. The idea was to build, you gotta put this in inverted quotes, cars built in Europe, designed by Europeans for Europeans. And that's really what Nissan wanted to do. So in order to really have products, you know, hitting the spot in terms of regional markets, they empowered local engineers like myself to do that work. Um, now, that does not mean we were doing it in a vacuum that, you know, they, they set up an R&D center in the UK and said, yeah, please guys crack on with it. We were working hand in hand with our colleagues in Japan and particularly in the advanced phase, the early engineering phases, that was executed in Japan because that gave us access to Nissan's catalog of platforms and powertrain and some fundamental uh, components that would be shared with many, many vehicles. So very long story short, we started the project in Japan alongside our Japanese colleagues. And then when we'd done the early component selection, the basic outline of the vehicle, we came back to Europe and drove forward with the project. Um, to the production and start the production in Nissan Sunderland plant. So talking about those platforms, obviously you'd had the Renault-Nissan alliance by that stage. Mm -hmm. you, got, you got access to a whole load of different platforms. How come you ended up having to essentially create your own variant or your, your own platform? Mm. You, yeah, and, and, and you're right to allude to this because this is one of the most important decisions to make in any car project. And particularly this one is, you know, what underpinnings are we going to put on this vehicle? Um, because it's rare to have a blank sheet of paper and, and nothing at all that's either carry over or carry across. That's an extremely rare situation. So we had a choice of using the Renault platform that underpinned the very successful Megane 2 series. So code name, the, the B84 vehicles. These are, you might remember that these are the famous Megans with the, um, with the, with the bottom, with the kind of sticking the bottom, um, which, which, which gave rise to a very cool series of very unpolitically correct French ads at the time. So that was a very successful platform, but we didn't really have a lot of influence on the costs of that platform, the supplier selection for that platform. And it, we really weren't able to control everything. And we knew from the B32A project that we needed to have control, particularly cost control over every aspect of the platform. We looked at using some of the smaller platforms that Nissan had that later went on to underpin vehicles like the Micra, the Note, basically B segment vehicles, but stretching those upwards would have limited us. It would have limited us in things like tire size, fuel tank capacity, ride and handling, et cetera. So again, to cut quite a long complex story short, we pitched to our top management in Japan that, look, we need a new C platform. Not completely new. There's always a little bit of DNA carried over from previous projects, but we made the business case and the technical case to effectively design a new platform on which we would build not just Qashqai, but a whole series of vehicles. Uh, the Nissan Rogue, or Rogue Sport, that's well known in the States. The X-Trail would sit on that platform. Vehicles like the Renault Collios, so it would finish by being an alliance platform. So the platform ended up building many, many millions of vehicles, um, and we were able to justify the creation of that platform uh, in the early 2000s, driven by the Qashqai project. I must admit, I'm quite surprised that you got the green light for that, because given the fact that this is a new platform and 
you have no idea what the volume is going to be. You can guess, you can mm. have a, have an idea, but you don't know. And you're saying, well, we want a brand new platform. I I, I understand you took bits from other platforms, but I'm, I'm very surprised that you, you managed to, to get that green lid. Oh, I can be very persuasive when I want to be Andy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I wish I could claim that it was simply a case of Irish charm, but no, it's cold, hard mathematics. Um, the secret really was what, what I just mentioned. We were proposing a platform, not just for the vehicle that would go on to be Qashqai and be very successful in itself, but for a whole family of vehicles. So we were able to show the you know, the pretty cold, hard facts of the volume effects of the automotive industry showing, you know, if we source dampers or cooling systems or fuel tanks on this, this amount of vehicle, it will amortize the R&D effect and the tooling required to create a new platform. And with hindsight, luckily I'm touching wood here, it was absolutely the right decision. And we were very lucky in that we had support of Nissan's top technical management at the time. Um, I won't list the names of all the folks responsible, but I will just give a name check to my boss at the time, the platform chief vehicle engineer, a gentleman called Kimias Nakamura, um, who I would give absolute credit for taking that decision. Mm, absolutely. Um, so in 2004, you come up with, or someone comes up with a prototype of the Qashqai. Um, how, what relationship was that to what you guys were working on? Was that something that the design department kind of mocked up and then sort of threw out to say, hey, maybe someone might want to buy this. Let's get some reaction. Uh, you're probably talking about the, the concept car, Andy, that yes. was shown. Um, yeah. So, which was already called Cash Guy, by the way, very unusually. It was already called the con Cash Guy concept. So, you've got to imagine this happening in parallel. So, my team, the engineering team, are working on the platform selection, on powertrain packaging, on selecting the key suppliers, et cetera. And in parallel, our colleagues in the design studios, plural, are working on the, the creative side, the exterior, interior shapes. And sometimes I'm asked the question, you know, what, which comes first? Is it the engineering hard points or is it the design sort of creativity? And there is no right answer to that. The, the, the true answer is they're genuinely happening in parallel. So we had at least two studios working in a friendly competition. So the central corporate design studios in Japan, but we had a brand new design studio. At the same time, we had opened what's now known as Nissan Design Europe, based in a top secret location in London's Paddington. Um, I won't give you the exact address because they wouldn't be happy with me. <laughs> they like to keep the cars a little bit secret. But the Paddington studio came up with the vehicle you mentioned. Um, and it was already, I mean, it's very different to the final prototype vehicle, but you can already see some of the proportions, some of the design language, as my designer colleagues would, would, would say, you can already see some of that coming through. So that was an initial concept um, proposed by the NDE, the London Design Studio, but the, it wasn't the final shape of the vehicle because the, there was still a long road ahead of us in 2004. But was that pitched? Because I presume that, that that was shown Geneva Motor Show. That was to try and get um the public's impression to try and work out just how popular or not this this product was going to be absolutely and that that really is the well there are two purposes for concept cars in motor shows either it's a pure brand building exercise you know purely just to put something cool out there and and, and generate some headlines to be honest or it's an attempt by a manufacturer to exactly like you say to gauge the interest see if folks like it see if customers are coming asking about it and that's, that, that's what the, that cash guy concept was. Uh, the, the crossover, again, the crossover idea was not guaranteed to work in Europe, even though Murano, as I said, had been very successful in the States. Um, HRV, Honda HRV that I mentioned, that wasn't a great success, actually. So we weren't at all sure that this was going to be a home run. And one good way of testing the market is to show a concept car and get some feedback. And behind the spotlights of the major motor shows, the concept car was also used in intensive customer clinics, you know, behind closed doors where we would use uh, real people, let's say, to, to, to get their feedback on the size of the car, the design of the car, the proposed specifications, and crucially, the pricing of the car. Absolutely. So we're getting towards the final stages of development of the Qashqai and you tell a wonderful story in the book about the, the rear fog lamp and the, ah. uh, the, 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 the slight 
problem that you had with that, uh, which is, oh man, that that would just that would have killed me. I'm sure that that was a that was a hard problem. But um, can you can you maybe point out maybe one or two other parts of the car which were maybe didn't quite go according to plan? Oh, oh man, Andy, you're asking me to reveal all the secrets. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can. And to be honest, I, I had I had a a store of stories like this. I, I, I had to select them for the book, ones which are repeatable and ones which are not. But I think I did mention somewhere in the book that, you know, the folks who've worked on cars like this, it, it, it's really a curse because when I see a Nissan Qashqai, I only see the things we got wrong. You know, I don't see the shape of the car. I don't see everything we got right. I just see the little thing. Oh, hell, why did we do that? Exactly the same for all the other vehicles I've worked on. Um, so I won't repeat the, the, the fog light story, but yeah, just let me tell you one other quick story of similar, similar nature. Um, if you look very, very closely at a generation one or generation two Qashqai, and you look at the split line of the rear tailgate or back doors, some Europeans will call it, just above the rear lights, you'll see that it's got a slightly strange 3D shape. That's just, it's not quite a clean line. I mean, you really have to look close. And the reason for that is, you know, I'm at my desk. It, these things always happen on a Friday afternoon. Always, Andy, always. If anyone comes to you at like 4.30 p.m. on a Friday afternoon and you're chief engineer for a vehicle, you're in trouble. You're going to have a long weekend. So the body design manager, um, who shall remain nameless, walked up to my desk and I noticed, again, about six feet behind him was one of the CAD engineers from the body design. And I thought, ah, oh, okay, here we go. We've got a problem. So they explained to me that we had a problem with the gas strut layout. And the gas struts on, on, on the rear tailgate of a, of, a, of a vehicle, they seem quite simple. But in fact, they have to work at extremes of temperature. That means when the gas is hot, they still have to be able to pop the tailgate. They still have to be able to hold the tailgate up in very hot temperatures. And when the gas is cold, they still need to be able to pop the tailgate open and hold it up there. And I remember them explaining to me that, look, we've got some of the calculations wrong, boss, and at cold temperatures, unfortunately, the tailgate is going to fall and like hit you on the head. So I wasn't very happy about this. Um, I, won't I won't use some of the words I, I, I repeated. Um, and then they explained to me that we'd actually also got a problem with the hot temperature condition so that when you pop the trunk, it would do this and hit you under the chin. So basically, we had the two worst case design conditions, the, the, the tailgate wrist hitting you on top of the head and then coming back up and tipping you in the chain. So the only solution was not just repositioning the gas strut, but actually changing the cut line on the rear tailgate, which had already been designed for them. So this required me jumping in my car again, setting off for the design studio again, and explaining to the designers that, sorry, guys, we have to move the cut line by a couple of millimeters. And I actually applied the black tape to the clay model myself. I think it's the only time a designer actually allowed me near enough to a clay. Um, so that's the one line on the vehicle that I executed myself, and it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, many, many stories like that, Andy. If I told you every little, uh, every little issue on the car, we'd be here for a very long, uh, a very long discussion. <laughs> well, of course, you see all the all the mistakes on the car, but the car was a massive success, and and quite rightly so, because you guys poured your heart and souls into it. From from what I, from what I read in the book, um, then of course uh, a year later, I presume it was a year later, you came out with the Kashkai Plus Two, the seven seater version. Um, was there a was there a feeling maybe if you rewound a few years? that it would have been better to have extended the wheelbase um, at the start so that you could, so you didn't have these two different versions, one with a slightly extended wheelbase. Because I noticed with the Mark II and Mark III versions, they have extended the wheelbase of that mm -hmm. car. Do you feel that in hindsight, it would have been better to have maybe made the car a little bit bigger to start off with? You know, I'm gonna give you an, an honest answer for that one. And the answer is probably yes. So again, back in 2002, when we were laying the foundations, yeah, we probably should have incorporated an additional roughly 150 millimeters, let's say six inches into the vehicle, which would have made, would have package protected in the jargon for that extra row of little seats and, and kind of hedged our bets for a seven seater. So yeah, it probably would have been a better decision. Um, that said, you know, there are benefits for keeping the car compact. Uh, don't get me started on mass reduction. 
Um, so, you know, keeping the vehicle's dimensions compact, keeping it relatively short, keeping the wheelbase relatively short, there are also benefits on that side. But you're probably right. From a purely economic point of view, we probably should have uh, anticipated that in 2002. But I still think we were reasonably ahead of the game um, in 2004, 2005, when we proposed to say, look, you know, this vehicle looks like it's going to be interesting. It should be a winner. And we propose, let's offer also the seven-seater uh, version of it. It was very controversial at the time. We had some good, uh, I believe the official expression is healthy debates, um, sometimes known as stand-up fights uh, about that project. And it turned out to be a, a very, very popular um, product, especially in certain markets. Um, certain markets really fell for the Qashqai Plus 2. So where I am here in France, for example, um, you, you, you see many, many of those vehicles on the road. It appealed to families with small kids, which is exactly what we were aiming at. Yeah, I mean, hindsight's a wonderful thing. And I've, I've done many projects myself. And um, you know, if, if you knew everything you knew at the end of the project, at the start of the project, then, uh, you know, you'd be a genius. So um, I think you yes, guys sir. ended up making a lot of very good decisions up front, which, of course, translated into a very successful car. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, this is easy to say with hindsight, but I think the car industry, every decision does not have to be perfect. Cars are imperfect products, um, but it's important to have the ability to make decisions. And sometimes that old adage that sometimes a bad decision is better than no decision. There's a grain of truth of that in, 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 in car development, actually. You have to have the the courage to make decisions. They won't all be 100%, like the little stories I told about the fog light or the rear cut line. But if you have a very high batting average, if you're making 99% good decisions, you can largely get away with the 1% of, let's say, suboptimal decisions. Or at least I like to tell myself that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your impressions of the Mark II and the Mark III vehicles? Obviously, you weren't part of those, but I'm sure you have uh, feelings of, you know, uh, what the products did and what, what you liked about them. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I can take no credit for those vehicles because by the time the Generation 1 was, or Mark 1 was launched, I had been transferred across to work for the other side of the Alliance to, to Renault, um, which is another story. Um, so I can take no credit at all for the um, life, life cycle maintenance, as the Nissan jargon would have it, of the subsequent vehicles. The first thing I would say about the Mark 2 or Generation 2 is um, the guys did an absolutely fantastic job of correcting a few things that we would have liked to do with the Generation 1. I'll, I'll pick two, two quick examples. The front headlight design. So the front headlight design on the Gen 1 is, there's nothing wrong with it. Technically, it works. It was an excellent design. I'm going to name check Stefan Schwartz, who takes all the credit for the, the, the design of the vehicle. But they were a little bit badly executed. Again, I'm taking that as my fault because I was being very, very, very careful with the purse strings. Uh, I mean, extremely careful, Andy. Um, and those headlights were maybe a little bit over-economized, let's put it that way. Whereas the Gen 2 vehicle had a much more attractive set of headlights. And as a result, the front end just looks a little bit tighter. Um, they also, Nissan also refreshed the interior. The instruments in the, in the Gen 2 were a little bit crisper, a little bit more modern. And I think that vehicle, I may be wrong here, the Nissan guys will correct us if I am, but that Generation 2 or Mark II cash guy, it was ex actually the most successful of, of them all. It was a very, very big seller. Um, so all credit to the guys for keeping it um, refreshed and modern. Then the Gen 3, of course, was a big change, still sitting on the same platform, but there had been a lot of technical changes in terms of emissions requirements, particularly. So new powertrains coming in. Also, uh, you know, times had changed. So... Uh, driver assistance was required, uh, a lot more technology, better infotainment, et cetera. So it's a far more sophisticated vehicle, still keeping to those sort of, you know, feet on the earth, cash kite, um, you know, principles, but it's uh, it, it's quite a, it, it's a much more modern vehicle. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for your time, David. This was been, it's been a really good interview and a fascinating insight into a project which I would normally never have managed to, to hear. So thank you so much. No, thank you, Andy. And I, I want to thank you again because you've, you've picked up in the interview and, and, and in researching the project. I think you've said it yourself, that the, the team that worked on Qashqai did pour their hearts and souls into it. And, you know, 
I know it's just an ordinary vehicle. There's nothing fancy about it. It's not a supercar. It's not a sports car. You know, it's just practical family transport. But I can tell you from personal experience that the the men and women that worked on that car over the years really have poured a lot of themselves into it. So it's a car I'm still very, very attached to uh, because I know how much passion, how much time, how much effort has gone into it. So really happy that you're helping uh, share the story with a, a wider audience. Thank you, sir.